Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Please get your seats. Thank you, Mark. We need to talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be here, Rob. Okay. So this is year two of this panel. Uh, last year we had a lot of discussion about how to optimize your application via build time switches, uh, what kind of switches you can use to help run under parallel computing or other types of uh, processes. And this is not about build packages, that will be tomorrow. <laughs> but if you ask, we may answer that for you. <laughs> Um, this is also an event that is coordinated through the Northwest C++ Users Group. Uh, we're heavily involved in this area and also heavily involved in CppCon. And that's, uh, we just wanted to do these kinds of panels to show what we do on our regular meetings and try to help uh, organizations throughout the world try to um, help them to know what kind of materials they can present for their local user groups. So, um, my name is Brett Searles. I'm the Vice President, as I said. Hey, oh, you're not going to take over this one, are you? Okay. Um, and I work with ARM and Android, and uh, especially SIMD Neon Processing. And um, I will hand over to Chandler. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Chandler Kruth. I work at Google on Clang and OLVM. And I uh, really like, you know, making code run faster, even, and especially the easy way, just like with the command line switch. So. Hi, I'm Ian Fairman. I'm at Microsoft. I work on the Visual C compiler, which I guess everybody refers to it as MSVC outside of the world. Um, I've been on the optimizer team for 17 years. I know all about uh, MSVC compiler, the ins and outs, so hopefully I can answer some questions and help some people today. Hi, my name is Xiang uh, Fan, and I'm also from Microsoft. I work in Microsoft Visual C Public Compiler front end team. And we were going to have Michael Wong, but I guess uh, he decided that SG14 wore him out or something. So, <laughs> so um, if anybody, this is a user panel. That means that it allows you, the people, to ask questions. We're not here with any set information. So please come up to the one of the mics and um, please yeah, ask. Like you all actually have to ask questions or this gets really awkward really fast. <laughs> We'll just keep you here in silence. <laughs> uh, my question is about VLW architectures, where all the compilers you see there are really soft in optimization. So, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, VLW architectures uh, were kind of like multi with parallel execution units and I really have to do like, I would say, not to compile a lot to make it do a decent job, but in the end, uh, like if it's really critical, you have to do assembly most of the time. Well, I know that from my work in ARM, uh, yes, the compiler does do a pretty decent job, uh, and it depends on which compiler you're using. If you're using a standard GCC or Clang, it will interpret it one way, but if you use like an ARM uh, compiler, it will even go further into uh, making it more parallelized. However, still, it doesn't really know what you really want to do with that code. So yes, you will have to maybe inline assembly or something like that. So, Does Microsoft's compiler do anything with, do you have any VLAW targets that you get to talk about? I once worked on the Itanium compiler, 
Like that was the first thing I did out of college. So we don't right now. <laughs> so so uh, Oldium has a backend for uh, a couple of which for one particular VLA that we chip in the open source, and it's the Hexagon chip from Qualcomm. Um, and it does an okay job at it, but it's it still is pretty rough. VLAW uh, presents a really hard challenge for compiler technology, especially a, a more DSP style VLAW like the Hexagon compared to the Itanium, which was hard enough. Um, plenty hard enough. But uh, because of the, the nature of it, right, you, you, you essentially makes uh, instruction scheduling incredibly challenging, right? And instruction scheduling is already one of the hardest things that optimizing compilers do today. And so when you take the thing that compilers are already kind of bad at, and you say like, okay, but what if you did like something with 10 times the constraints? It, it's really challenging. So, so I think they actually do a great job given the complexity of the problem, but I understand that it's still not entirely satisfying. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering if the uh, OG flag was going to receive any more love, and if Microsoft is also thinking of implementing some type of debug optimization Okay, so the OG flag is um, doesn't really have any meaning these days. So it was originally what, what, What's the OG flag? Okay, so <laughs> that's an excellent question. Um, if we go we go back in time. The, the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, or maybe it was the Visual C compiler at the time, didn't have a global optimizer. It had a local optimizer. And when the global optimizer was added, we added a switch, the OG switch, to turn on the global optimizer. Um, so those of you who know about compilers, a local optimizer is just linear code sequences, and the global optimizer is optimizing what we would normally call an optimizing compiler today. So the OG switch itself doesn't really do anything today. It turns on the optimizer, but you, don't, you shouldn't use it directly. The O1, O2, OD, those are the ways you should be controlling the optimizer. The other switches can be used to fine tune the compiler, but the OG one is pretty much useless. If you turn it off, it, you're not really getting optimized code. Well, was that the OG flag you were asking about? I was referring to the claim one. Ah, I thought so. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to have a, sort of like a debug only that won't affect your. So, so yeah, let me, let me try to explain uh, the OG, the other, other OG flag, okay. um, which claim does not actually have, but we'll get back to that. So OG was added to GCC, and it's a flag to GCC that tries to run the optimizer in a way that minimizes the confusion it creates when debugging the binary. And so it turns off optimization passes that don't preserve uh, good debug information. It actually does extra transformations to make it easier to debug things, those kinds of changes. Um, I don't think any of us work on GCC. Do you ever touch GCC? So I don't know that we've got the right group up here to talk about what the GCC folks are doing on OG. Um, I have no idea. Uh, I can speak to what LLVM's thinking about, and then maybe you can talk about optimized debugging, because I think you all actually are the ones who could talk about optimized debugging info way more. Um, so, so optimized debug info in GCC started off really bad. Ooh, there's a Michael Wong, too. Sorry, guys. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Um, so, so, so optimized debug info in GCC started off kind of terrible. It wasn't, it wasn't all that good a long, long time ago. And uh, the GCC community has done an absolutely amazing job kind of bringing up optimized debug info within their compiler. It's now substantially better than it is in uh, Clang and LLVM. Um, and I don't know that Clang and LLVM folks are really going to pursue the particular way that GCC does OG. Um, but I know that folks in the Clang and LLVM community are really interested in optimized debug info and having a better solution there. Um, my personal belief is that we shouldn't have a separate optimizer mode for this, though. Um, so, so right now, the O1 optimizer level in Clang and LLVM is kind of useless. Um, it's, it's a very peculiar set of optimizations. It does one category of inlining and one category only, and those are the functions marked as always inline. <laughs> it also does that inlining at O0, which makes it kind of silly, like not doing a whole lot. But then it essentially runs the entire optimization pipeline, just having not inline things, which is really confusing, because like, I don't know, O1 to me think, seems like it should be something that's like super fast to compile, just does a little bit of lightweight optimization. 
And it turns out that when you don't inline almost any functions, but you run the full optimizer over them, you get a super slow compile and very poor optimizations. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really know why this is terribly useful. I'm not a big fan. Um, I would like us to take O1 and turn it into something that is a super fast compile with like plausible optimizations. That's what people kind of expect. And I think within that framework, it would make a lot of sense to also preserve debugability to the greatest extent possible. Um, if we try and go to heavier levels of optimization, I think that keeping the debug info uh, uh, really high quality the way OG does in GCC is going to be really, really hard. Um, and I also don't know that there's that it's important to separate out O1 from something else. So that's kind of the plans that I'm aware of with LLVM and Clang, but they're really nebulous, right? Like, I don't know of anyone who's like actively working on it today, and so it could be, it could be like six months, it could be a year, five years. Um, if you know anyone who's really interested in this, though, like I know the community would really love more con contributions in this area. It's, it's lots of interest, not a lot of time. But I know Microsoft's compiler does a really good job at optimized debug info. It's actually why we want to do it. We get compared with yours, and people are really unhappy. Well, yeah, so you mentioned it's a hard problem to generate debug information for optimized code, and so Microsoft has taken the opposite approach of trying to do less optimizations to be more debuggable and try to solve the problem of how do I debug optimized code. So we have uh, a switch for our compiler, the Z O switch, which I think is on by default in Visual <coughs> Z O, I think, is the public switch. Yeah. Um, it's, we have too many switches. Anyway, if you go into Visual Studio and create a new project, you just turn on your optimized debugging. And what we do is we try and put enough information in the debug records to undo some of the more common optimizations. And so, for example, we put inline records into the debug information, so the debugger can then display uh, the frames that have been inlined while you're stepping through your code. Uh, we do things like put the register information of where a variable goes, so as a variable goes in and out of register, we can report the information in the watch window as you're debugging. Um, we keep good records of variables that get completely optimized away, so uh, if a variable does get optimized away, the debugger will tell you this instead of just presenting wrong or incorrect information. Um, we try to improve it with every release. Um, Visual Studio itself recently added support for the debug, uh, the inline records. You can see the your inline call stack in there. Um, we had an intern in the summer who did some experiments to see how far we could take this, and we actually had some some cool results of undoing other optimizations, like undoing loop transformations and other things. So I don't know if we'll productize all that stuff, but it's it's certainly uh, an area we, we're going to continue to explore. And before we go, are you done? I have a lot of questions. I don't mind this. No, no. <laughs> um, but before we go to the next question, I'd like to introduce Michael since. Uh... Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Wong. I'm the um, I, I, I'm the VP of uh, research at Cloudflare. Like, um, but um, so we we use a, um, a version of Clang compiler that generates generate codes with GPUs, uh, DSPs, and FPGA using the SQL C++ uh, heterogeneous C++ language. Prior to that, I was uh, for 20, 25 years. Um, the team lead for the uh, IBM Excel compiler. Um, well, we just basically uh, we, we we follow C++ 11, 14 steps, 14 standards. And just as I left, well, before I left, I started introducing Clang onto on the front end for, for Linux, and I think that worked out pretty well. So that's pretty much my background so far. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we'll go here and then come back to you. So. We have optimization levels kind of in all of the major compilers, and I wonder if that is sufficient. So the compiler do not have a lot of context about what the user actually wants. Uh, are we interested in latency or throughput, uh, mean performance or worst case performance? So I was wondering if uh, you see a way to make optimization flags uh, more aware of the customer needs, basically. So, which, I mean, what kind of platform are you working with? Are you working embedded, or are you working uh, application level? Um, I, I'm working on the front end. I'm, I'm just wondering. So I do not have a specific use case in mind, but uh, it seems to it seems a bit weird that the optimizer right now is kind of a one size fits all thing, and uh, maybe maybe there is such thing, but I, I don't know. I, I, 
it's, I mean, it's, it's very true, right? The more information the optimizer has about what you're trying to do, the better job it can do. So anytime we can get information about the program, what the developer's intent was, that can help us. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I guess, if, as, as a front-end developer, if you want to get more information to the optimizer, you, know, you can always try and use it to, get, to do better optimization. So we'll, how would latency fit into that? Because UI is running on a single thread yeah. and things like that, so you're going to have a lot of latency there because of the making the graphics and things like that. So how would you use an optimizer? How do you think the optimizer would fit what you need for monitoring latency, I guess? Okay, so for example, for latency, uh, Let's look at vectorization. So if we, for example, vectorize a loop, as far as I remember, there is some delay for filling all the vector registers, so we get results later, even though the throughput is uh, better. So I, I was wondering if these trade-offs are, uh, if these trade-offs are uh, not the same, we are optimizing for latency or throughput. So I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the type of lockstep executions that is normal through most pipelines, through most pipelines and most software architectures um, that is implicit in most compiler generations for vectorized code. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty much standardized, I mean not standardized, but it's pretty common for most compilers to generate these kinds of lockstep executions. It's proved to be the most optimal for keeping pipelines, keeping the keeping the registers filled and all as as we move forward. Um, if you're talking about um, um, how it how it can impact latency, I, th I think that's what you're going with, right? Um, I don't have any particular insight on that. I'm just trying to verify. That. I'm just trying to let you know what compilers optimizers do right now for for auto vectorizations, um, even though. Even though I even though I chair the um, the, the, um, the the low latency group, I can't really come up with anything that is in particular that is in that space yet. The, there's no delay when populating a vector. Yeah, we fill it as much as we can. There's no delay. I mean, put differently, if you didn't have enough compu like computation elements to fill the vector, then we wouldn't use the vector. I see. Right? Unless we had a way to partially fill the vector and leave the other things blank on predicated architectures. And on those architectures, though, we still wouldn't pay for the lanes we didn't end up filling, right? And so there's not really a trade-off inside the compiler between latency and throughput, right? To what Michael's saying, like that's it's not a trade-off that the compiler has any control over. Um, the closest thing to that I'm aware of is there was a lot of research. Um, I think Michael and I may not entirely agree on the conclusions of this research, which would be exciting. There's a lot of research around optimizing for power usage versus for performance. Um, and, and this idea of high power instructions versus low power instructions. Um, that's the closest to a throughput latency kind of trade-off I'm aware of in, that compilers actually face. Um, and in that space, I have a somewhat controversial opinion that I don't think that these trade-offs work. I think that the best power saving technique is to race to sleep, and so you optimize for performance, and then you turn the processor off. But, and, and, and I at least have some uh, agreement on this particular panel, but there are, there are a lot of people and even companies who are really working on the other approach, which is rather than racing to sleep, they try to find a lower power implementation for particular operations. Um, so I don't know, like, like, I don't know that there's, a, there's any kind of settled answer to this question, right? That kind of my personal theory. But the, the only low power um, thing that we've kind of followed on is that um, generally, fewer locks, um, fewer cycling locks will will will, generally will be lower power. Yeah. So that's why some people will have hoped had, had, had hoped that transactional memory or lock elision would not would, would would give you lower power performance. That was sort of the so beyond the the, <coughs> the, the old promises of transactional memory, you know, scalability, whatever. There was also a certain research that was hoping that it would actually lead towards um, lower power and lower power. Um, but like. The compiler doesn't really get to do much with that. The programmer kind of has to use that. The programmer would have to do that. It was nothing to do with the compiler. The, the programmer would just have, you know, by just using that, you would just generate fewer logs. If you have a lock elision techniques, you just wouldn't generate a logs until, until you actually fail. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't know if really answered your question. Okay, okay. and uh, I have like one, one more regarding, uh, one more uh, extending on this. So uh, we have very few levels in most of the compilers. So I wonder uh, if it would make sense to tell the compiler how much time budget do I have that you can spend to optimize this thing. For example, uh, if I'm going to run this thing for a year because it's an expensive computation, maybe I'm quite okay with the compiler running for a week, optimizing this or for a day or something like that. I have no data on that. I, I mean, I, I thought about just doing something like this, with, but I, I just didn't know if it was possible for the compiler to actually, to, for the optimizer to actually figure out. I, I know what you're trying to say. Make a trade-off. If it's going to take, you know, uh, 20 hours and it's only going to give me this much speed up, sure, maybe make an intelligent decision. I never did anything about that, but I thought about some, doing something like that. But my question was always um, whether compilers, optimizers can actually give you that kind of statistical data. Maybe these days with machine learning, you could actually do, do something like that given enough samples. I never thought about it at that time. But at that time, I, I, was, I was up at that end. I don't know. Well, I, only thing I would say is that I, from, it's, as a, I'm an optimizer guy, I listen to my customers, and what they always ask for is a faster compiler. Right? They, I don't get a lot of customers saying, make my code faster. And it's weird, because you'd think that's what people would want. I mean, but usually what I get is, make the compiler faster. So, I, I, it would be cool to be able to just make that trade off, but I don't. I don't know if the investment will pay off in the end. Well, one of the things that my current company does is we just take a lot of power, you know, measurements as well as, you know, run tests over many, many samples. And then we look at the code and say, oh, this is running in this layer. How can we optimize it running in another type of platform? So I, I, so I work between Java and C++. So I know the Java is going to take a lot. So how do I make it work in the C++? But then again, you're always having. I mean, that's why you have a job is because you just always have to tweak your code. So <laughs> I'll try and do maybe a better answer for what you're looking for. I at least do have some customers that want their code to go faster. Um, uh, and, and mostly, it, I see this with my kind of. You know, open source LLVM hat on. Uh, LLVM has some users in the HPC community that would gladly run the optimizer for a few days if it made their code run faster. Um, this is actually a very hard trade-off for the compiler to make right now. Uh, we don't have good facilities. So, so you can think of like compile time trade-offs that most modern compilers make um, falling, falling into a, a couple of buckets. Um, one of them is they can choose to use uh, a, a a uh, linear algorithm, or they can choose to use some polynomial algorithm, usually quadratic or something, right? And they always choose the linear one when they can. And that's not a trade-off we can really give people because the nature of these algorithmic scalings, it's not about, you know, does it run for, you know, a short amount of time or for a longer amount of time. It's does it run for a short amount of time or does it never finish, right? It's, it's, not, it's not this like super granular thing uh, that you tend to run into. And so from that sense, right, like we, we, there's not much we can offer. Um, but then in a bunch of cases, we don't have a linear algorithm. All we have is some polynomial algorithm. And a bunch of those times, we essentially put some arbitrary constant threshold on top of this polynomial algorithm so that the compiler finishes. And there, we can, we can move that threshold around if you want it. Like we can set the threshold like twice as high or three times as high. The problem is a decent fraction of these thresholds, while they guard compilation time, they also tend to guard other things that, that have bad impact anyway, such as code size. And so, right, like a bunch of the thresholds like this, we could set them really high if you want, if, and it would, you know, increase the compile time a lot. But while it might kind of naively seem to, you know, let the optimizer do a lot more optimizing, it would end up producing so much code at the end of it that running it would actually still be slower. Uh, there are probably only a few places in the compiler where we can just like, you know, ratchet up these thresholds and, and it's strictly better code coming out of the compiler. And, and my suspicion is that if you, did, if you tried this and you ratcheted up all the thresholds, you'd find that like, well, it, you had really diminishing gains really early on. And you just wasted a tremendous amount of time waiting for the compiler to come back with not much benefit. 
Uh, there's about one interesting exception to this that I'm aware of. Maybe they're more in the machine learning direction that Michael was saying. And that's the idea of iterative compilation. Um, there are a bunch of parts of the compiler that are stuck because, well, if we optimize A before B, then we can optimize B better. But once we optimize B, we can optimize A better. Right? And we have to then like pick an ordering, um, and, and that ordering sometimes is, isn't optimal. And then maybe we try and like iterate a few times, but we then have to set some threshold on that, and maybe we could raise those thresholds. Um, so folks have looked at doing that in LVM, um, and they haven't, they haven't made a lot of progress, but they're, they're still kind of poking at it. But my, again, my suspicion is we're going to find out that the diminishing returns kick in super early. Uh, maybe, maybe machine learning, uh, folks are familiar with super optimizers. It's a research area, but super optimizers look more like the first case. It's a super, super badly scaling algorithm. So you run it on like, you know, thousands and thousands of machines for days and days and days, and you get like interesting results, but then you, you have to find a faster way, a more scalable way of incorporating them into your compiler. You gotta get more people, come on. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm a big fan of Thin, thin LTO. Um, we turn it on as soon as we can get it. Um, but a couple months ago, uh, this is on Clank 391. Uh, a couple months ago, I tried Clank 6, and the Thin LTO linking time quadrupled. Uh, and I've been looking for updates to it because, you know, fanboy of it now. Um, but I haven't seen anything, so has a lot of work gone into it that just has kind of flown under the radar, or is that something weird that I should be worried about? I have no idea. <laughs> That's not a lot of information. Like, I mean, like, first off, Clang 3.9 is like one, two, three, four versions old. Like, that means it's like two years. So most of the LTO has been largely rewritten in that time. Maybe there's a bug. Maybe it's way better at optimizing. That's my hope. <laughs> File a bug if the generated code isn't better. <laughs> See, customers asking to make the compiler faster. <laughs> well played. <Thank> <laughs> Hey, Chair, last year at uh, CPP Now, we talked briefly about optimizers, and one of the things that you would, you, I think you said you wanted to see was the ability to mark sections of code as don't bother to optimize it because it's just initialization code or it's terminal code. So, has any additional work been done there? Do you think that's still a good idea? And I came up kind of with an idea of maybe I can mark some of these guys as no inline code and get them out of the way and maybe the compiler won't um, won't um, spend any time on that, it can spend more time somewhere else. Um, not a lot of work has gone on there that I'm aware of. Um, yes, I'd love to see more work in this area. Um, I don't think you want to mark things as no inline because uh, while, while that does turn off the optimizer, it may turn off too much of the optimizer. It may actually make our compile slower rather than faster. Um, we, we need a better, we need a more accurate semantic model. And I don't know how much progress other people, like, like uh, is currently being made in the community. But I think folks are interested in it. I am one of those people that want the code to go faster, and I'm willing to sacrifice compile time because our continuous integration does that, not me, most of it. <laughs> All right, but but you realize so 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 now every time you come to the mic, you have to say which of these you want. <laughs> we, we keep score. <laughs> uh, so one of the more interesting optimization packages that compilers provide is optimizing for size. Um, and uh, I've got two questions regarding this. The first one is. How come it's often faster than O2? Um, and the second one is how much would, uh, for the uh, obvious to everyone semantics of marking functions as no unique address, which is totally not proposed yet, but let's say you could do that, and then you would be able to, you know, fold like dot begin of all of the vectors to the same thing. Um, how much would that actually help? Well, uh, so when you say the it's faster, you mean the runtime is faster? Yes, the runtime is faster. 
Likely because the code is either fitting on a page or it's fitting your other code on the same page or your code fit in, now fits in the L3 cache or fits in the L2 cache. Or but then like why that. didn't O2 already do it? <laughs> the compiler is constantly making trade-offs, right? It's not a solved problem. So we, may, we do the best we can. Um, it's interesting you brought up compiling for size. So a lot of, it's a common practice in um, our internal customers like Windows and stuff to compile binaries for size. You have all these binaries that hardly ever run, and when they do run, they don't really do anything computationally expensive. So you compile them for size, you, you squeeze them down. Um, so w one of the recommendations that we have for our customers is to use profile guided optimizations. Because uh, one of the key things that profile guided optimizations will do, figure out where the hot paths are in your program, compile those for speed, compiles everything else for size. Um, that's a great way to make to allow the compiler to make the decision for you. So you don't have to worry about which parts do I compile for speed, which parts do I compile for size. Just let the, let the my profile figure out for me. Um, was something else in there? What was your second part of your question? Oh yeah. Um, let's oh see. yes, unique address. So no uh, unique address. On the yeah. Projects. So our uh, our linker by default when you run full optimization. Ah, so the question is about uh, a no, no unique address, which I didn't know someone had proposed. No, no, it's totally not proposed. It's not I proposed. You just made it up. Like, you just made it up. I okay. Say it did so it does exist because when you run the Microsoft linker, it will fold together functions and not care about whether they're supposed to have a unique address or not. And break code. Yes. Uh, <laughs> every few years, we do get a uh, we get a complaint from a customer that says, "Why did my code not work?" And we point to the documentation and say, "Well, you have to turn this." Feature off, which is on by default if you're going to require unique addresses for your code. We find, like, because, like I said, over a few years it breaks somebody, but it's such a small percentage of people that we feel it's safe to be on by default. Um. Does the same applying as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, Clang isn't a linker. Uh, the, the linker on Linux is called Gold or Benutils, and there is a, it's called ICF, identical gold folding, so you can do dash dash ICF equals full. And then you get the same semantics in the same box, and you can use dash dash icf equals safe. And theoretically, you get most of the benefits without the broken semantics. But I've got some questions around icf safe. I don't know that like we've actually got it implemented the right way. Um, LLVM's linker is currently looking at icf and what it looks like and what it doesn't. Um, and so, so, so yeah, no unique address is interesting. Um, however, it won't help your compile times at all. Not asking for that. It'll just, like, all it impacts is, like, like this is mostly a linker thing. It's just not a compile time thing right now, unless you use LTO. In which case, it starts to be more interesting uh, to, in that it enables some compiler optimizations that are currently not enabled because they essentially do a general code folding, and it breaks the semantics of C++. I just want to add, in the last year or so, we've added uh, ICF safe to the Microsoft linker as well. So if you're like to get some of the benefit of the folding, but you're, but you're worried about conformance, you can use that as well. You don't have to turn off completely. And we actually mentioned the build switch. <laughs> Just point out that's the first one we wrote. Well, okay, OG. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, not taking sides here, but I wanted to make a comment on... Can you hold on a second? Run faster or compile faster? <laughs> we forgot to pull you. <laughs> he needs the annotations. Go ahead. So if you want your build to take longer for some hope of performance improvement, the profile guided optimization isn't strictly speaking making your compile take longer, but it does make your build take longer and you might get some benefit. Good point. I like this. I think everyone up here agrees PGO is awesome. As long as you're profiling data set. Uh, as long as your profiling data set is, is an accurate representation of what you want the compiler to optimize. That's awesome. May I jump? May I jump in here because, like, I was actually asking about that and the glue cauldron. I think also like Google developers were um, presenting auto FDO, which was like taking perf traces from the kernel um, and actually converting them to profile guarded feedback for the GCC compiler to compile the Linux kernel and. Uh, having spoken with some, um, I guess, of your colleagues, they, they say like, even like if they have measured or like profiled the wrong, wrong workload, they still have like such a huge benefit out of profile guided uh, optimization that it makes sense. 
and, and that's great, but if you profile the wrong, wrong workload, you might not be happy with results in general. It's, it's not as great, but they said like they basically apply profiles now basically every any, uh, all the time. So I wanted to ask about like feedback. I don't use it. Um, just like, do you see use of it a lot? I think it's actually quite difficult nowadays to build it into a like building pipeline because of the built infrastructure C++ has right now. So, um, yeah, profile guided optimizations are difficult to use. Uh, that's, that's a true statement. We're working on trying to improve the experience um, in general um, in the long run, you know. Um, but the benefits are there if you can afford it, if you can add it to your build pipeline, if you can get the right uh, profile scenarios. It really is the, the right way to, to optimize these days. Everyone should be thinking about not just how do I build this, but how do I build this, what are the scenarios I want to be using for my profiling, and then how do I get that information back into the, my, my build pipeline. Yeah. So this is a, another area. You, you as the, um, the developer are also trying to make trade-offs. Um, um, these PGO um, um, processes can be onerous, um, they do, they, undoubtedly, they, give, they, they can give benefit, but there's lots of got you's and lots of caveats, right? I mean, um, yes, the, the report can be quite difficult to read, even for us, okay? So never mind for someone who's not used to, to reading it. There's lots of places that you've got to be looking for, whether it's because of some cache effects or some instruction <coughs> moving around. Um, you, the, what you profiled on may not be the same as what you actually run on. And that's just going to make the whole thing pretty close to invalid. Okay, if you work with anything like spec spec benchmarks, you know they always have a um, a version that's 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 profiled. Um, there's a training data set and there's a test data set and there's strict guidelines to make sure that that um, the final ultimate data set is somewhat similar but not so similar that you're literally just copying something over and, and just making it more. Um, I guess you know having been a programmer for you know, the first 20 years of my life, I no longer program as much as I used to. Um, I was always trying to make a, a trade-off, right? Um, can I just, instead of going through the process of going through a PGO, which can take me as long as maybe a half hour, more than almost a half hour to an hour of work, analyzing, the, you know what I'm talking about. Is it better if I can just look at the instructions? So this is where the Godwell compiler helps me a, a lot. If, I, if I'm just looking at a small, small set of code and I've already isolated what the problem is, I may be just, just uh, switching between O and O2 and O3 and looking to see what instructions have moved and hopefully that will be enough. That's, that's kind of like my shortcut. I don't know if that works all the time if I'm not willing to make the full trade-off but they're right. If you really want to find out what's going on you pretty much have to move do the full trade-off and say you know what I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to invest my lunch time and just go through this this, this bloody analysis report. Hi, uh, is there any plan to support LTO static libraries? So, for example, now on LLVM, what they do is actually emit like DC, use LLVM link, and then basically downgrade the linkage of a few symbols, and then they run the compilation. I don't know what you mean, support LTL and static libraries. Like, do all of the optimization of static libraries, basically export few functions, and optimize it as much as possible. Like, you want to ship static library to someone else. Okay, I understand. Um, so is he asking shipping a version of it that's already link time optimized? Yeah, 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 with the export yeah. list. Yeah, so we, we actually did that, you know, and then you, you would have to statically bind them and all. It was, it was a complicated procedure, but it's yeah. doable. I, so, so I believe that you can give it an export list even if you're not building a DSO. Yeah. And it should then be able to do LTO on the static library. If not, that seems a reasonable feature request, the LVM linker. I mean, what they do is, I use the LVM link, basically to create one huge BC file, and then just compile it. Sure. But yeah, it's, you don't have support the LVM link on every... But it seems like a fine feature request for an actual like user-facing tool, rather than using the LVM link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, I know that there is a single object for link where doesn't it do something similar to that? For static libraries? Uh, so, 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 sure, if you have a single object per link, then, then that's already the case. But like, the whole point of the question, I think, is that you, you're, 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 you've got a big set of compilers trying to build a single .a file that you set, ship to a customer. Um, and, and you want to use an export list the way you would use with DSO to get link time optimizations. I don't see any reason to not support that pretty directly. 
You already have the technology of like having an export list that's the functions you're going to LTO against, right? We should do one more for this one because because that 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 line got to go twice. <laughs> oh. Sorry. I have a related question. It's okay. We'll come back around. We'll come back around. Uh, this is actually for Android. Um, we've been wanting to ditch GCC for a while and move on to Clang. Uh, we found that when we move to Clang, uh, our binary size goes up by thirty three percent. So I'm hoping that I can use Clang's OC optimizations within LTO to try to get that size back down. But I know with OZ, our performance did get hit. Uh, does thin LTO and OZ, do they not at all play well, or not play well with each other, but do, do they kind of like offset the performance hits that we hit? And would we be able to reclaim that? Uh. <laughs> so OZ is going to hurt your performance, like, like a lot. So, so for, for folks who don't know, OZ is a weird claim, somewhat claim specific flag that doesn't mean the same thing as OS. It's much stronger. It's do everything in your power to shrink the binary. I don't care how much it hurts performance. <laughs> well, you said you didn't care. <laughs> uh, I don't know about, like, I, I would focus on trying to figure out why OS made your binary bigger and see if you can fix that. Well, I know there's an open issue on MDK, and a lot of people have their hand, but I don't know if that's getting any attention. I, I don't work in the on that part, so. Yeah. Sorry. But I thought you were the guy that was using 3.9, right? On Linux. On Linux, okay. Before alpha. So. Okay. Next. I originally came up with a kind of unusual question, but uh, the previous for the person, they uh, they were talking about using LVM link to make a a bit code file and a static library. And that's been a, a use case of mine in the past, uh, especially on older client versions. And actually, is is it the same? Uh, if, if I take a lot of bit code files and then combine them together, is that the same as link time optimization? Is it better? Is it worse? What, like, should I expect the same? You, you have to run the separate step. All the LVM link does is merge. You then have to run a link time optimization step over it. And, and Different than just like running 03 on it? Well, but running with what? It's now a bit code. Oh, half, a lot of time I just say, like, Clang, taking the bit code, 03. Uh, I don't <laughs> know that that will really do what you want. Um, there's, a, there's a separate pass pipeline that we try to use for post link LTO. Um, the other thing you really have to do to make LTO powerful is you have to have an export list if it's not the main executable. We need to know what functions need to continue to be exported so that we know the entry points. Otherwise, link, otherwise any kind of like cross-module optimization is, is way less powerful if you don't know a, a very small set of entry points. Okay. Finally, the question that is not specific to just Chandler. <laughs> um, but, but probably not the direction compilers want to head in. Um, with Spectre and Meltdown, one of the fun things about it was that uh, it kind of depends on training the branch target buffer and, and various things. And are compilers looking at optimizing code placement to maximize the usage of the branch target buffer and the branch history buffers? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have to worry. Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you want something more than yes? Are you happy? Or are you sad? <laughs> I wasn't sure. Do you, do you want your code to compile fast or run fast? <laughs> So I spend uh, quite a lot of time in Godbolt looking at what happens when I compile various small functions, and I sort of go back and forth between being very impressed and very depressed. Um, <laughs> and I'm curious to know, you know, I, I do a lot of, of this kind of optimization work, but I don't work on optimizers very much. So I'm curious to know, if I see something where I wrote a function, and in my head, it definitely should have been able to do a better job than that, should I think, oh, maybe I can contribute to Clang or something, and there's some new optimization pass that just 
isn't there yet that might do this? Or should I think pretty much all the optimization passes that are worthwhile have already been invented or already in there, or it would probably be more trouble than it's worth? I mean, what, how should I think about like how, how open I should be to thinking there might be more optimization um, patterns that might be worth trying to work on? In general, there's always more optimizations we could do, so to think that everything's been done is way off. So, but it, maybe you could answer this question. And also, maybe, I mean, for, for Clang, particularly being that it's open source, like, what, um, how do you think about how much weight an optimization has to pull to be worth sort of adding the complexity and maintenance of the code base? That just turned into like a real question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so it depends. I mean, uh, so, so first thing, I, I, I want to like give like this generic way to put this, like you should always at least be interested in filing bugs, yes. right? And, and then for any compiler, right? Like you see, you look, you look at the Compiler Explorer and it's like, nah, this would be way better than that. You should have a little like file. Is Matt Godbolt here? We need to file a bug button. <laughs> I, I did invite him to the panel, but he said he has not been working on optimizations this past year. Uh, but he was on the panel last year, and he decided to have a panel on Friday. So. He's just la uh, landed in Seattle, so... Well, tell him to get a taxi, come on! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, anyways, anyways... He's a brownie face of God's ball. Something, right? Like some, some, or, or just like a little bug, but anyway, anyway, we're off topic now. Um, jumping back to your point, though, uh, about Clang Millivium in particular, it is a great open source project, uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan, obviously. Um, it really is hard to say whether it's worthwhile. It depends on the nature of the optimization. So let's say, like, you find, like, some math that, like, doesn't combine and fold away. That's basically always worthwhile if we actually can do it, and it's always simple, right? Like, there's just no way that's going to be, it's going to matter how often that comes up. It's just going to matter, is like, is it always simpler to do that fold? Sure, we should do it then. Um, if it's a more complex thing, like, then it starts to be a little bit trickier. Are you going to need to have an entire new, like, optimizer pass and infrastructure just to do this? Uh, maybe, maybe not, it depends. Um, on the flip side, the maintenance burden for, like, adding a new optimization, the maintenance burden, adding a new optimization to compilers is actually pretty low. Um, most of the complexity in the compiler doesn't come from a new optimization. It comes from everything else. Everything above it, everything below it, it's really, really hard. Um, so you want a new pass, that doesn't seem scary. Uh, if you're willing to actually write the code, that's most of the cost right there for a new optimization pass. Um, other things are a lot trickier. You want to do like some super fancy like instruction synthesis, that's hard in the compiler. Maybe, maybe that's more challenging, but I also would like I feel bad if you want to go and try and modify Clang or LVM to like do better like instruction selection for a particular architecture. That part's a nasty part of the compiler. It's just it's a super complex problem. It's super hard to work on. Um, simple things I think tend like simple optimizations tend to be simple to implement in the compiler um, and tend to be worthwhile. Yeah, I'm just thinking about times when I just saw, for example, a branch that I was think that should be able to be just completely optimized away because maybe the two the two um, options in the branch like do essentially the same thing um, in some way that seems ob obvious to me when I look at it. So, so you should absolutely go and try and implement that optimization. Okay. But because I'm a nice person, I'll point out, you may be really surprised. <laughs> this may be a bit of a trap. Uh, it, those kinds of things in particular tend to look really simple and not be really simple in Psychopilot. Like prove, prove that these two sides of a branch are equivalent but not the same. <laughs> the, the, there's, some, there's some papers about this. It's, it's hard. Okay, thanks. The way that you describe profile-guided optimization is it picked and chose what should be O2,3, what should be OS. We can't really afford our build to get any slower. Um, is there a way to like add attributes to be like we don't really care about <coughs> this module or ideally function, but function is di functions disappear, I imagine. Yeah, like this question similar to one that was asked earlier. There's no like formal way to say something like that. Um, if you're wanting to go in by hand and 
mark functions like optimize this, don't optimize that. That might you might get some mileage out of that. I know we've had instances in our own code base where we've had um, like <laughs> uh, dynamic initializers that take a really long time to compile and we turn off optimizations around them because we know they just get run once on startup and we don't care about them. So you can get sometimes fine tuning your build that way can help. Um, yeah. Underscore underscore attribute underscore underscore open print open print. Cold, close print, close print. I think that's what I was looking for. But understand that, like, you're gonna put that on, and you're gonna be like, oh yeah, this is awesome. And you're gonna like take the, and you're gonna compile it. And it's not gonna make a difference. You're gonna be really frustrated. You're gonna copy that code into like Compiler Explorer. And you're gonna like run it. And you're gonna turn the take the attribute off and put it back on. And you're gonna see it doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> But it'd be cool if it would. <laughs> it will also make me feel better. So, so we actually do do a few things with, with attribute cold. Uh, we synthesize p some pieces of the PGO stuff with attribute cold, and you all you all should add like a dental spec with this. Um, uh, but it's not it's not perfect, uh, there, and, and there's still a lot of work to be done on it. Um, and it'd be great if it were standardized if anyone wants to write a paper. Thank you. Uh, which optimizations? from your point of view, shouldn't be done by compiler. You realize that we work on compilers, right? <laughs> Anything that uh, has a running time more than end login. Customers get real upset when we those. Uh, okay, so now compiler... Oh, so we, we do one more, like, Something that requires uh, uh, semantic knowledge, like like deep semantic knowledge. Something that, that, that there's no way I can understand as a compiler, but that the program's like, well, no, obviously I prefer you do this instead of that, right? Like something that's very domain specific. Yeah, the compilers can't change your algorithm, so you got to find the best algorithm first, right? I mean, that, maybe that's what you're getting at, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I'm asking about changing algorithms, so. We can try to compile. Oh, sorry, compiler can try to detect which algorithm I should try to replace. For example, I wrote my own super duper quick sort, and compiler should, and from my point of view, must. If compiler can prove that two sort will be faster in this way, should replace my own quick sort by two sort. But compiler can't do it yet. So you're, for, so you're asking for a smart compiler with unit tests in it. Of course. <laughs> but that, that's what your job is to do, is to do the unit tests and... I'm not sure that uh, it's my job. So here, here's, 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 an interesting, here's an interesting thing to think about. So you have your, your fancy sort function, right? And, and let's say, I don't know, it's bubble sort, right? Okay. Right? And you're like, oh, come on, come on, replace this with std sort. But see, there are a bunch of cases, for example, maybe you, the programmer, happen to know that you are never sorting more than four elements. And I said about uh, when compiler can prove that std sort will be faster than my bubble sort. But, but it can never prove that. You can. <laughs> pa Patch is welcome. I, I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I want to believe you because I want the compiler to get better. But, but let, me, let me rephrase. I don't know how to teach the compiler to prove that. In some cases. So if you know, then we sort, for example, no, no list than one million elements. It's a specific case. So I, I, I like where you're thinking. I like where you're going. And the compiler, I'm oh, serious, the compiler does do this to some extent for very specific, very small cases. For example, we do detect when you've written memset or you've written memcopy, and we go, that's memset. I'm going to go call the CRT routine, which has been super optimized, or I'm going to say, oh no, you're doing a fixed number of elements here. I'm going to unroll this sucker, or I'm going to do whatever I do. That in and of itself is hard enough. I can't, like, trying to get a sort algorithm, that's, that's pretty far out there. But we do do that sort of thing, and that is something that if we can get enough semantic information, as I mentioned earlier, we can do better jobs. But proving that this is semantic equivalent to that, that's a really hard problem. So, so brief joke moment. 
So it turns out that this is, this is a, there's a great paper that you might be able to find. I wish I could remember the exact name of this. It was a paper which proposed teaching the compiler to recognize a, a diagonalization, like a matrix diagonalization algorithm, and replace it with like the super clever, like, like very advanced math version of this that I don't even understand from linear algebra. And, and like use like eigen like like link eigen into the compiler and do all of this like dimensionality analysis on the matrices and like replace these like numerical algorithms with more efficient ones. Um, but it was unfortunately a joke paper. And, and the interesting thing here is it's not that the compiler doesn't know when an algorithm is better than the other one. You're right about that. It actually does know that some algorithms are just better. The challenge is detecting it. Right? And the detection is really hard, right? As, as we were saying, right? we can detect mem set and mem move and mem copy. And I think recently Clang finally figured out how to detect uh, uh, the population count, like counting bits set in an integer and be like, aha, and like emit the pop count instruction on hardware. But, but like, it, that's incredibly hard. And so to say like, oh, we'll do this for sort, I mean, like, that gets back to, like, the kind of halting problem thing. I can't prove that you've written sort most often. It's super hard, right? So I don't know. I think it's really hard to do this, especially in lower than in local in time. All right. And uh, about the question of lack of semantic information, uh, what about getting some information from civil was 20 contracts? And uh, using this information for implementing more aggressive Optimizations. <laughs> so I think you can add that information, but I'm not sure even if we parse that information to the back end whether they can actually use because it doesn't like directly map to the instruction set that would, or I mean the, for example tuples for our uh, UTC whether it can actually map that information to the actual tuple that it has to proceed. Do you have any idea, like whether even if we part that information along, whether that can be, and you can give some high-level information on like what this function will do, but whether we can actually take advantage of that is not that easy. And sometimes we can't. You really trust the input from the customer. You know, backend still have has to like prove that your providing information is actually correct. For example, if you actually like add not accept, the compiler doesn't really owner your, I mean, the compiler will not trust you. It will actually generate try cache and call std terminate if it actually throws. So the contract is actually like sometimes can add overhead because the compiler has to verify that your contract is actually correct. Ian, didn't, with assume, did we have to roll back some of the code because we were generating on the, we were in retail we were generating bugs because we were trusting the assumes. Remember there was something you, you rolled it back? Yeah, I actually removed it, so yeah. 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 It's not actually like a wrong. Uh, yeah, we, we got worse optimizations. Yeah, so assume yeah. is like a good example, like yeah. if we blindly trust the right, 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 user, right, 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 right. then sometimes backend will generate the wrong code and you will get silent bad like runtime behavior. So for any like real standard conformant like saying like not accept or contract backend will actually or I mean we will not directly honor uh, uh, we will probably like do the validation but we have to, we still have to prove that it's actually like trans it's actually valid to do the transformation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, those are really interesting questions. Hey, uh, so I care about runtime a lot. Um, <laughs> Excellent. You know, kind of following up on the VLW compilers. Um, so I got pretty good ideas here on what to ask for my compiler members, like uh, profile guided optimization. Uh, maybe ask them to support plugins for optimization. So it's like if we detect cases where the compiler should be doing a better job if we can. <coughs> so like, and what do you mean by plugins? Yeah, so that's you know, the form, you, you, you uh, define. So that's what I want to ask you guys actually. Like, what advice is uh, like if I were to go to them and say, hey, guys, I, I need this to be better. Like, what kind of things can I ask them? Like, I guess profile guided optimization should be one. Um, 
profile guide optimization, link time optimization, <coughs> program optimization, uh, global register allocation. I mean, if you can do that, though, good luck. So, specific, so I don't know, so I'm, my experience was from my, the BLA was from my a long time ago, but profile guided optimization was really the thing that made it work. Because you needed, required so much speculative execution that if you tried to do that everywhere, your code would be huge. You have giant blocks of recovery code everywhere. So in order to make it work and get enough uh, linear code, you have to do all this speculative code. And so if we have profile information, we know what is the hot trace, where do we do that? So that, that could be a big win. Yeah, that, that could definitely help a lot, uh, especially on the arcades where you don't have any branch prediction or anything, it just throws the whole pipeline away. Uh, but the biggest is, we, I see a lot of like, non-utilized execution units. Like yes, structuring scheduling is hard. <laughs> Regarding the topic of supplying the optimizer more information about my use case so to optimize better. So, one of the only advantages a VM based programming languages have uh, is the fact that the VM runs with the code and it can solve dynamically, statically unsolvable problems, un undecidable problems. So, did you <coughs> consider uh, like running the compiler with some, in some kind of a mode uh, in which it will generate like uh, information for it to recompile the code the day after with better solution, better optimization. I didn't, I didn't quite understand that. The idea is to recompile code during execution. Given that the Dynamic recompilation. Oh, given that the day after day the, the inputs will be almost the same or like, like, like jetting at the Yeah, yeah. like, like uh, Chris Leitner's thesis, uh, his master's thesis, lifelong program optimization. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm being a little facetious. Uh, the, the, the thing I, I notice is, like, uh, profiles also let you solve indecidable problems, right? And there's not a huge difference, right? If I have a profile, I can be like, okay, so it's probably, the answer to this question I can't answer is probably going to be this. So I can generate a version of the code that assumes it's that, and I can generate fallback paths to handle when it's not, right? And so, so you can get really close to the same thing that, that VMs do with a, with a really good profile. Um, but I don't know of anyone who's done uh, online, online optimization of C++ programs and it's proven successful. Um, and, and that was originally the reason to build LVM and it didn't go very far. So. Thank you. It sounds like a bunch of you, or most of you, use uh, the online Godbolt stuff and I know how I use it and so when you're looking at Godbolt what is the assembly syntax you look at and why is it in Godbolt? <laughs> I don't like this question. Let's start us off. No, you guys go first. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. <laughs> we all got to get AT and T forever. I can't stand Intel syntax. I can't stand trying to figure out the register, like the register width, by looking at the name of the register and hoping I don't forget. Anyways, well, we only meant one format. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Intel one, which is the same as what our backend produces. So I. I, I I probably look at a couple of them just to just to make sure. But I do agree that the x86 is kind of uh, brain twisting because it's just too much reversal reversals for me. I don't. I mean, not to 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 say that Godbolt is not the the be all and end all, but I want I always use a couple of a couple of other online compilers to check as well too, um, because Godbolt doesn't run yet. I know he's working on it. I always want to. I also look at compilers that that, that, that run the results to see what, what it's, it's, where it's going as well. And I always have a whole bunch of compilers on hand just to verify. These days, it feels like it feels like that to, to well, judge well, whether something is correct. It's no, like a Supreme Court opinion. No, but Michael, Michael, you're you're you're, you're, you're answering the wrong. But I think you're answering the wrong question. So on x86, there are two assembly dialects: AT&T and Intel. Which one? 
I do not care. I could look at both. Fair enough. Well, the point is, is that as one hacker said, even assembly code is too high level. Because in a x86, you can be pushing your to an 8-bit register, or a 16-bit register, or 32-bit. So you don't know which one you're really doing it. Doing it. So x86 is pretty complicated, yes. No, no, with, with at and syntax, though, you do. No, 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 with Intel, you do. A-L, A-X, A-X, R-A-X. I'm with Brett here, like, like you can always look at the encodings. There's the whole uh, 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 object mode of, of Compiler Explorer that's really nice. Just checking the encodings and the instructions. Anyways. I have a question about uh, build switches. Uh, <laughs> what switches do you guys see most frequently misused, or which ones should we avoid at all costs? That's not fast math. Fast math. <laughs> so, I have a switch that's a pet peeve of mine in our company. So, we have a switch that's OX, which for many years we documented as maximum optimization. <laughs> Which unfortunately is not really maximum. Uh, O2 is actually gives you more optimization than OX. So if you are using OX today, you should probably switch to O2. Now that said, don't panic if you're using OX. The addition, most people throw the extra switches to turn OX into O2. But if you're not sure, you should probably just switch to O2. The big difference is. O2 turns on the non-optimizer switches that you want that give your make your code more optimal. Or OX turns on all the optimizer switches. So, thank you. I, I, I think it's pretty much for me, it's almost any of the optimizer um, options. There, there's so many of them that it's almost <laughs> impossible. To, yeah. F unsafe loop optimizations <laughs> are not fun, safe loop yeah. optimizations. <laughs> I don't know why we have F unsafe whatever else, but we do. The problem is you can't excise options after it's been put out there. That's one of the things. Yep. Hi. I have a bunch of questions about call size. Okay, first. So you mentioned you don't want like optimization that optimizations that require semantic information. But like for example, I think you all do the optimi optimize the way the new like news followed by deletes right now, right? So if I do like nope. you do, I check not everyone. Not everyone. Not all compilers do. Okay. But Clang and GCC do as far as I saw. So I think that's a semantic information requirement. Sorry, sorry. I misspoke. I, I didn't mean semantic, I meant domain specific. Okay. Sorry for my, my okay. totally my bad. So, for example, does uh, like turning off exceptions and immediately turning them back on count as domain specific? Because like I do embed it and like sometimes I look at the assembly and it, and it inlined a couple of functions and it, like now I have like turn off exception interrupts and turn on interrupts right next to each other. So is there any way to annotate to the like the compiler to don't do this, like just optimize these away. Is there any way to do this? So we, we actually just discussed this at SG14 today about <laughs> the idea of having a, an attribute that, that covers a region to tell the compiler to, opti to, to optimize or not optimize, so similar to your exception idea, right? Um, instead of being a full program. So, and I, I, I misuse exceptions. I mean, I try to man interrupt. Like, there, it, it's just like, Two, in, two instructions right next to each other that yeah. can be optimized away. So, so at a high level, you're, I think you're talking about you have, you have a pair of functions and they're toggling and you want the optimizer to recognize that this is an on-off toggle, so if you see these together with no code in between, yes. eliminate them. Yes. That's an interesting idea. I don't think we have anything like that. Okay. So, I, okay. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Other than that, I have one more uh, call size related thing. <laughs> So, as embedded developers, we sometimes have to use bad C programmers libraries, in which, in one case, I used like a SHA-2 calculation function, and it, it compiled to like five kilobytes of code, when I looked at the source, of course, the smart C programmers were doing it with like macros, and like, it, I don't know, it unpacked into like 200 lines of code <coughs> like that, 
unrolled a whole loop that could be, like when I re-looped, like, I don't know, I rolled the loop, turned back to like 200 bytes of code. Is there any way to get some sort of uh, like loop on unrolling optimization that kind of <laughs> sees a pattern and <laughs> loop? Makes a loop? Dash F re-roll loops. Yes. <laughs> doesn't exist yet. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a passive LLVM that actually does this, and I am completely with you. I want us to turn it on, because I get really tired of looking at like manually <coughs> unrolled code, and I'm just like, put that back in a loop. Our, our optimizer does have a pass that does that. I don't know how good it is, or whether it's catching all the cases that you'd be interested in. But. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's amazing. I hope GCC guys get it soon, <coughs> if they don't get it. File a bug. Why not? Okay, thank you. Much as I enjoy <coughs> optimizing debug debugging and the improve improve improvements, one downside of it is the PDB is now enormous. Is there any chance of getting it drunk again? Oh, well, you can just ask Chris to order us more hard drives. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, I mean, it, it, you know, it's. Every time you add more, every time it gets richer, it gets, you know, it's getting, you know, compared to the size, you look at the size of the comp 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 compiler and the size of the P PDB, you're thinking, that's a lot, that's a huge growth in, in, in information. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you tried Clang Seal's new PDB writing code? Nope. You should. Okay. <laughs> it's probably going to be worse. <laughs> <laughs> So, in an ideal world, uh, when the compiler optimizes because of or based on some undefined behavior, we also have some mitigations, for example, a sanitizer to catch that kind of undefined behavior. And as a parallel to that, in some compilers, we have optimization remarks to see missed optimization opportunities, for example, the optimizer couldn't factorize uh, because some pointers might alias. So if we have a remark like that, maybe we should have a way to tell the compiler that those two things in fact might not alias. And I think this is not the case right now. For example, if I, uh, almost all the major compilers I tried, if I add an early return, for example, to that function that if these two things are aliasing than like return an error code or something like that. The optimizer still not, still don't know that uh, these things. So maybe the alias analysis is not flow sensitive. Uh, that is in the optimization pass by default. So what's your take on that? I'm not sure. What was the final? You, there was a lot. The last the stuff there. Um, I had some thoughts about. Uh, uh, alias analysis inside vectorization. So, if you, uh, our, vec our auto vectorizer, and I'm sure other ones do, have a, a way to tell the loop, hey, I'm, I'm telling you the things in here don't interfere. So, if you're using MSVC, it's pound pragma, IV depth, I think, mm -hmm. or, or no IV depth. Yeah, IV depth. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's ways around that. In general, though, yeah, <laughs> alias analysis is an area where we, I know my compiler needs to get better. Right, but uh, if I have a pragma, that force factorization, then if aliasing does happen at runtime, I will just get wrong results. Yes. Whereas if I have code to actually check that, uh, that I added, then it's different because I have a mitigation as well. So I don't really consider this to be the same. Okay. So I think what you're asking for is uh, something like restrict to annotate pointers as not aliasing. And there is a paper that Michael Wong and I are co-authors on, but don't ask either of us too many questions because someone who's not on the stage, Hal Finkel, is actually doing most of the work on it, uh, is trying to put uh, something even more rich than restrict into C++. Um, and, and that'll let you actually annotate pointers instead of annotating the loop but then the auto vectorization can still begin. Um, Does it do checking? It can. We have restrict pointers, and, and that's a problem, right? If you're wrong, you're SOL. So, so 
One reason why the paper hasn't gotten updated, though. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so fundamentally, restrict is not good enough for C++, yeah. and we know that that's a problem. We know that it doesn't cover many cases that we care about, like overlapping storage, like member storage, and things like that. And you just, you know, I, I can't even do your whole question, but I imagine that you cover, you're talking about one of the cases that we've been trying to think about. Um, the implementation of it, I, I think, is, is you know, something that, that Hal is trying to do. We have, we have a design. Um, it doesn't, f I think it fits pretty much like about 90% of the use cases we wanted to, to, to do. Yeah. So, if you can get that, then you might be able to get what you're looking for. Well, but the checking thing, uh, one reason the implementation has kind of held up and that this paper hasn't made it as far is because I complained at Hal that we didn't have any checking for this. And so he's been trying to build a sanitizer for aliasing. Um, and it uh, turns out that's really hard. <laughs> so, so yeah, we first we want to sanitize it for it, and then we want to have more aggressive alias analysis. Uh, the, the other thing I'll point out is you mentioned that we don't have flow sensitive alias analysis, and that's really true. Um, and I, I think the only compiler I know of that ever had any serious flow sensitive alias analysis was XLC, actually. Um, it had a very limited amount of it because flow sensitive alias analysis algorithms are really slow. Um, and again, it's not the kind of slow where you, it's a, like, you know, it's fine, I'll, just, I'll take a slow compile. It, it goes uh, cubic and, and higher very quickly uh, because it's flow sensitive. Um, pass sensitive is a little bit more common, um, and field sensitive is very common um, in really, really good compilers. So, so ICC and XLC both do uh, field sensitive and path sensitive alias analysis in some parts. I don't think Microsoft's compiler or GCC or Clang or LVM do much of this. I think GCC has field sensitivity, but not path sensitivity. Um, it, it's hard, though. Yeah, it, it, it is. I can tell you that, that the alias part of, of the Excel compiler has been rewritten over and over again, many times over 20 years. Yeah. Okay, so aliasing was more of an example, so but there was a trying to get that uh, the communication between the developer and the optimizer is kind of one way. And uh, if, for example, the optimizer cannot do a transformation because it cannot prove an assumption, maybe there should be a way for the developer to express that this assumption sh is actually true in the code. Microsoft's compiler has this. We have, they have an assume intrinsic. Okay. Yes, it's, it's terrifyingly awesome. <laughs> so, um, in the past few years, there has been one optimizer that was very, very unusual in that it, well, number one, had branding all by itself, and uh, number two, it had uh, backward information to the developer, and number three, as far as I know, no actual compiler has actually landed it by default, and that's polyhedral optimization with poly in LLVM and graphite in GCC. Um, or maybe I'm just... XLC definitely did some polyhedral stuff back in the day. I shouldn't say. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I no longer work stuff. Sure. <laughs> so my question Rumor is... has it. <laughs> is, is it ever going to land by default in like the normal switches or will we forever need to like turn it on on a case-by-case basis? I can't predict the future. So, so, so the reason it's not on by default in, in GCC and, and, and in LLVM is not because like, no one's trying, it's just that it's A, really complex and hard, and B, in a lot of places it regresses things, it's, and, and that makes it even more hard. The biggest challenge that they face is how do they make it a regression-free thing. Um, and that's hard, that's really hard. Um, um, like I said, there is this commercial compiler called XLC, which we won't talk too much about, but it does some magical, magical stuff. But they had a huge team working on it for a long, long time. So it's, it's going to be really hard for open source compilers to get that good. Thank you. Okay, so given that we care about compile times, or at least many customers care about compile times, uh, <laughs> it would be nice to have more support to profiling the compile times. And I know that Visual Studio has some compiler suites for that, although they are not really documented. Do we have plans for Hey, my, my colleague is working on some tools to give you an idea of like uh, how the compiler spends its time, and uh, some of the preliminary like uh, profiling information is already uh, is already available, but it's not. In, I mean, it's not documented. But uh, in the incoming version, we will have a tool to do that. And, and in the latest 15.8, we already have that data generated if you want, but there isn't a tool to analyze or realize that result. There will be a tool. 
for uh, our compiler in the coming releases. The yeah, for the, but it also includes other informations. Like we also want to include information about the, I um, mean, for example, MS build system, the time is spent in building each project or like some critical points during the build. So it's not only compiler, but also like some related uh, build system. Uh, you can just like profile claim. <laughs> it's not so easy. So, so I, weirdly, the the way Clang itself is designed, profiling Clang works better than you would kind of expect for understanding the front end. Um, <clears throat> Clang's front end tends to be fairly uh, uh, the, the call stack actually tends to be fairly indicative of what it's doing, um, and unless you're in the optimizer, in the optimizer it's useless. Um, but if you're in the optimizer, there's a dash f time report that you can pass, and GCC has dash f time report as well. GCC, the profile is a little bit harder to look at just because of the architecture of the front end of GCC, but I believe it has some extra flags that will add front-end information to the time report, um, and so it gives you some counters. Uh, it's not super well visualized. Um, and all that tells you what the compiler is spending its time on. It doesn't tell you what your code is doing to make the compile slow. Um, for that, especially if it's template code, which it often is, there's a tool called Templite that's a template instantiation profiler and debugger. It's really, it's really, really sweet. Basically, it simulates an execution to show you all the instantiation paths, yeah. which <coughs> theoretically, it's almost like a, I guess, you know, I've, I've, I wanted to have something like something, something like a compile time debugging. Right? Yeah. Just imagine what that'd be like. Uh, next person with the microphone. <laughs> Gotta build the mic. Alright, next. Okay, um, so GCC has this feature called function multi versioning that allows you to compile certain functions uh, with different um, optimization types, more specifically for, for different CPUs with different instruction set support. And then at runtime, it selects the most appropriate version if there are any available plans for supporting that um, in other compilers. No, not at this time in our compiler. Um, so I'm trying to be very careful what I can talk about here. Um, some compilers that I know of um, um, have always had uh, the ability yeah. of multi version. Um, to, but not necessarily to different switches, but that's not that far, far away, but, but to different architectures, right? So, but the, the, you're running into the next problem, which is now your code size is enormous. Like, all that code is just sitting there, and yes, it's nice that you can switch at runtime, but what are you paying for, right? So, well, so the code is never called, so... No, so, so, so it, still, it still spreads the code out. It's, yeah, it's still up there. So, so it might not be called, but... GCC's multi-versioning is, it has to be very conservative compared to other compilers. Uh, because it, 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 it hurts the code size too much. Um, uh, LLVM has the core technology of multi-versioning, the ability to have different programs with different uh, CPU uh, features enabled, but it doesn't automatically do it or automatically generate the runtime dispatch. And one of the reasons why is that it, it, it was really hard to automatically do it in the right places. And so instead what we usually do is we give the programmer ways to write source code that lets them control this so that they can generate the switches when they want, versus when they don't want. What's your take on the use of SIMD intrinsics, and does it interfere with your ability to optimize? They are awesome. They're way easier to optimize than the Intel intrinsics. But I'm biased. Someone on my team did most, like, like helped out with the work here, so. SIMD intrinsics are great, trust me. <laughs> Oh, you, you distinguish them from the Intel intrinsics, and do, do, does that mean they're they're more generic, or they have more semantic information than just like these are the assembly bits or something like that? So, so the Intel intrinsics are tricky, um, and, and keep in mind I don't work at Intel, um, so, so we're on the Intel compiler. Um, so, so the Intel intrinsics, the way they're documented, is very much like this intrinsic produces this instruction, right? And that's really frustrating for the compiler because maybe the compiler wants to constant propagate or do something else, right? Uh, so, so LLVM has been pushing back really hard against this interpretation of the Intel intrinsics and trying to push them towards having a very high level meaning. Um, a bunch of the, like, like uh, uh, 
on Windows, there's actually nicer named higher level intrinsics in a bunch of cases uh, that, that you can use instead, which is, which is great. Um, but we've, we've met a lot of resistance because the Intel intrinsics are so carefully documented as going to a single instruction. Um, and so one of the nice things about the SIMD stuff is that it completely removes any illusion that there's this guarantee that you get that instruction. And so it's a little bit easier for us to commit to implementing them in a generic way that's easy to optimize uh, without confusing <coughs> users as much. I think that the, the specification of the Intel intrinsics creates a tension where some users want like a hard guarantee around the instructions, other users want the optimizer to see through, see through them, and it's hard for us to make the call. So in, in the MSPC compiler, if you use the multimedia intrinsics, those Intel intrinsics, we treat them as semantic and not as specific architecture instructions. And our optimizer does a pretty good job of running, using the semantic information of them to do the same sort of transformations we would do on normal linear code. Uh, and we're continuing to improve that. That's an area where we see a lot of customers using these intrinsics to maximize the, the, all, the core, uh, all the parts of the core. And so we want to, and we're going to continue to invest in that. So that's what we recommend. For, we do absolutely recommend our customers do those, use them. And also, they run cross platform. So you don't have to worry about if you're working in assembler, you don't have to worry about, oh, does it run on this processor or that processor? All right, well, we have three minutes left, Ooh. unless you want to keep going. How many want to keep going? Okay, uh, so we have four people. If anybody else want to ask questions, please kind of come on up. Uh, but, speed round this time? Yeah, we're going to do uh, five words or less. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so go ahead. Uh, with Unity Bills catching on, does that work with or against LinkedIn optimizations? Five words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Neither. <laughs> it should be equivalent. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks. Um, probably a bunch or all of you have proposed features to the C++ language, and you're working on the big compilers, and you have big clients, and possibly your company is a big client. Is there ever like this tension where there's some feature that like you know will benefit your company or your client immensely, but you just can't ram it through, or you just want to be like, screw it, let's do this? Sorry, it's a yes or no question, but I, I want more, but there's no time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Lots of them. Kind of a genius. <laughs> <laughs> we want what's right. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes I feel the urge to tell the compiler that certain things will be true. Like I write an assert and I want it to actually be the case that the assert is false, it's undefined behavior. So sometimes I'm tempted to write something like compile my assert in release mode to if this is false, built in uh, unreachable. Is that going to do what I think it's going to do? Is that the same as assume that you were talking about that that has? Is this a good idea? Like, does this, I mean... <laughs> You're going over five words. Oh. <laughs> 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 Our certs turn into a soon. Nice. <laughs> what about compiler optimization proving? How we can prove that a compiler done some optimization in proper way? I I mean not manual testing or reviewing. I mean. Automatic checking. <laughs> Active academic research area. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so when will be rewritten inst combine in some automatic way 
it's in combining LLVM or match.pd file from GCC. Eventually, I hope. Okay, and the last question. When <laughs> uh, will be used in GCC or LLVM super optimizer? Super optimizer, it's I think you know, it's a super optimizer from John Greger. I didn't understand the first part of the question. When will be used? When when you integrate a super optimizer into Clang, LVM or GCC? When? When? It's already used. Well, <laughs> <laughs> a super optimizer is uh, another tool. So I should. Yes. Yeah, but when will you integrate this into LVM? Never. Why? It's too slow. <laughs> Not in every case. <laughs> Are you trying to get a job on Google? <laughs> How will const expert debugging work? We have 597 minutes for our next session. We can put a sanitizer on that thing, man. Overflow. LTO or Unity Build? LTO. Always? Always. Compiler don't support it. LTO and modules. Contrary tree, but thanks. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it was an enjoyable time, and hopefully tomorrow will be just as enjoyable with the build time, creating build time packages. So, uh, hope to see you, and have a great night.